And our first scripture reading is Joel chapter 2, verses 21 to 32. Joel 2, 21 to 32. Be not afraid, O land. Be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Be not afraid, O wild animals, for the open pastures are becoming green. The trees are bearing their fruit. The fig trees and the vine yield their riches. Be glad, O people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains and righteousness. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains, as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locust and the young locust, the other locusts and the locust swarm, my great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. And afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said among the survivors whom the Lord calls. And our second reading is selected portions of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so that the church may be edified. For this reason, anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret what he says. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. If you're praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who do not understand say amen to your thanksgiving, since he does not know what you're saying? You may be giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. What then shall we say, brothers? When you come together, everyone has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. All of these must be done for the strengthening of the church. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at the most three should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and God. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who's sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn, so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. So having wrapped up our look at James' letter several weeks ago, <clears throat> in which the focus was on faith in action, living out the new covenant lives that God has called us to, we've been taking a bit of time to go through some of the themes that have come up in there that James either didn't elaborate on or which we never had time really to look at. And so over the past few weeks, we've been focusing in on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And in particular, over the last two weeks, We've been looking at one specific aspect of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, but collectively what we talked about, even going all the way back to James, is within the Old Testament prophecies of the coming new covenant, which came in Christ, specifically at the core were various ministries of the Holy Spirit that we would be the recipients of. And so remember, it was broken up into two broad categories, like in Ezekiel 36, categories, prophecies that talk about God causing his Holy Spirit to dwell within us. And so in that new covenant passage, God speaking through the prophet Ezekiel said, moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you'll be careful to observe my ordinances. And so we've 
talked about or described that as being God's sanctifying presence, that the one aspect of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is that he dwells within us, transforming us more and more into the image and likeness of Christ. And we've looked at that over the last couple of weeks, and we've seen various aspects of that. And so we could look at ministries like the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit, the convicting of sin ministry of the Holy Spirit, the comforting ministry of the Holy Spirit, all aspects of transforming us into the image of God in Christ. So there's that. And so now today we're going to come to the other aspect or category, God's empowering presence. So Isaiah 59 says, as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord, my spirit which is upon you, and my words which I put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor the mouth of your offspring, nor the mouth of your offspring's offspring, says the Lord, from now on and forever. And so the pastor has fallen into two categories, God putting his spirit within us, God pouring out his spirit upon us. And we talked about we don't want to make too black and white of a distinction because there is considerable overlap, at least to help us get our, wrap our minds around what, what can be ours in the Holy Spirit. In this case, when pastors talk about God placing his spirit upon people, that's to empower them to serve him. And so that's what we're going to look at today. So when we think about God's empowering presence, how does God empower us for ministry, the obvious focus would be for us to look at spiritual gifts, which we are going to do just very, very quickly and, and pass on, because we're going to get into something that's a little bit more, more profound. But very quickly, reading through 1 Corinthians 12, a passage I think we're all generally familiar with. Now, there are varieties of gifts, and so at the heading of the slide, spiritual gifts with grace in, in brackets. So very often we refer to these, in fact, most of the time people refer to these as spiritual gifts, and rightly so because they come from the Holy Spirit. They're gifts the Holy Spirit gives to God's people to empower us to build up the church, to encourage one another, to strengthen one another. But the actual word that's translated as gifts there is charismata word that all kind of sounds familiar. How about charismatics? Charismatic. The root of that is the word for grace. So really, literally, what the word is is grace gifts. So what Paul is writing is now there are a variety of grace gifts. So why are these called grace gifts? Well, in the first place, because they're given to us by the grace of God through the Holy Spirit. But when we think about what's their purpose, their purpose is that when we exercise these grace gifts that God gives us, we then become agents of grace to those around us. And so when we're living out, we're exercising the various ways the Holy Spirit gifts us, we become vessels of grace to the people around us. And so Paul continues, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the one Spirit, to another the effecting of miracles, to another prophecy, to another dis the distinguishing of spirits, to to another various kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to, and here's the key point, to each one individually just as he wills. So they're sovereignly given to God's people by the Holy Spirit in accordance, in accordance with, with how he desires to do that. There are four main passages in the Bible, New Testament, that talk about spiritual gifts. There is 1 Corinthians 12. There's also Romans 12, where Paul puts it this way. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let each exercise them accordingly. So if prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. We're not going to look at them, but we could look at Ephesians 4 and 1 Peter chapter 4 as well. And the thing we would notice if we did this is the lists don't all agree with each other. They're overlap, but the point we ought to take away from this is there is not a catalog of a defined number of spiritual gifts. What we see is in each one of those letters, the author three of the times Paul, one time Peter, were writing to a particular church with particular needs. And so we ought not to go through these lists and think this is the exhaustive list of what gifts God could give us, nor should we really, which has been kind of a tradition in the church, especially in modern times, to go out and take classes to seek what might be the spiritual gift God has given us, but rather think about what they are. They're grace gifts. God has given each one of us some type of empowerment and these aren't always permanent. Sometimes they're one-off. Gifts of healings, for example, seems to be a really one-off thing. Here's an example. There's an example. So the idea is more like this. When we look at our congregation, when we look at our fellow Christians, when we're meeting with each other one-on-one, -on -one, the question we ought to ask is, what is that person in need of? What do they need? Do they need challenging? Do they need confrontation? Do they need strength? Do they need comfort? Do they need support? Do they need a warm coat? What do they need? How could I be used of God to bring grace into that person's life? And when we're looking at how can I bring grace into that person's life, how can I bring grace into the congregation, then we are, in fact, exercising that, that spiritual gift. But that's not what we want to focus on today. What I want to focus on today is that 
there's a deeper and more profound level of this spirit empowering that we can all we can all participate in, and we pick up on it in Joel chapter 2, which we know Joel chapter 2 is a very significant passage as far as promises of the new covenant. We encountered this when we did our study of Acts a couple of years ago. So our first scripture reading was Joel chapter 2, verses 27 through 32. It speaks of the day of the Lord, so we ought to talk about what is the day of the Lord. Throughout the Old Testament, there are various passages in the prophets that refer to the coming day of the Lord, and sometimes the language is shortened up in that day, on that day, but when you see language like that, what it's referring to is the time when God himself is going to finally intervene in his creation, fulfilling all the covenants he's made, with the outcome being the finalization of his kingdom. Now, what is really interesting is we can, from our point in church history, look back at Joel's prophecy and see that he actually shows a panoramic view of the entirety of the ministry of Christ from beginning to end. So in verse 27, we see Joel making a reference to the first advent. Like Deb said, next Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent. And in the Advent season, which prepares us for Christmas, we look back on the first coming of Christ, the first Advent, and we think about what was the significance of that and what did he bring to God's people. But as we do that, we also look forward to the time he returns again. So in verse 27, speaking through Joel, the Lord says, Thus you will know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and there is no other, and my people will never be put to shame. That kind of sounds like a summary of what we read in John's gospel that began with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glories of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So in verse 27, Joel is giving a prophecy of the coming of Christ. Then in verses 28 and 29, what we see is a picture of the church age that was inaugurated by the resurrection of Christ, his death and his resurrection. And so speaking of the church age... Through the prophet Joel, the Lord says, and it will come about after this, so after the first advent, it will come about after this, that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. And we know very obviously that it happens in Acts chapter 2. We'll look at that momentarily and, and briefly. But we can see that very obvious sequence. So after that, I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, on your sons and your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions, and even on the male and female servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. Then from there Joel looks forward to the second advent, the time when Jesus is going to return again, verse 30. And I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke, the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So when it comes in its fullness, and think about the language in the sky. When Jesus ascended into heaven in, in the beginning of Acts, what did the angel say to the disciples? Why are you looking at him? For in the same manner, the same Jesus will return to you. In other words, with the clouds. Jesus himself said in the Gospels that he's going to return in the clouds with power and great glory. So it's very interesting to see in those few small verses, Joel paints a picture of the entirety of the ministry of Christ in the church age from the time he first came to our living out our lives in the church age in between and then the return of Jesus himself. And then he gives a summary statement that ties all of this together. So from the time Jesus first came until the time he returns, this statement is true, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so there is the proclamation of the gospel in Joel about six centuries before Jesus, before Jesus first came. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be those who escape, and the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. But our focus, I want to focus in on the church age part here and the ministry of the Spirit, because the focus that we see in here is on Spirit-inspired communications. We've noted several times when we look through passages, especially in the Old Testament, that if we recognize most of the early audience to the books of the Bible from the beginning to the end couldn't read, that meant that they were written for others to read to the congregation, whether it was the congregation of Israel or congregation of the church. And so because of that, there were various ways of writing so that when it was read out loud, it would draw attention to the emphatic points. It would help people in, memori in memorizing. And so we see one of those chiastic structures that we've seen time and time again. On the description of the church age, how does the Lord speaking through a jewel begin and end it? It opens with, after this, I will pour out my spirit. He closes with, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And so the foundation of what the Lord is saying to us comes about because of the pouring out of his spirit. Now, on whom we could ask, is he pouring it out? 
on all mankind, on the male and female servants, and then we get into the middle, sons and daughters, young and old. And the point there is looking at the church, we have a full equality. That's the point Paul brings out, for example, in Galatians, where he talks about there's neither Jew nor Gentile, free nor bond, male nor female, that we all collectively are one. And so when we look at some of the demographics in there, those were not demographics that had full status in the nation of Israel. Those were not demographics that had full status in the culture of the day. But in the culture of the kingdom of God, we're all equal before God, and he pours his spirit out on upon us equally. Does a person think they're old and not useful anymore? God pours his spirit on you just as he does on a young one. Does a person think they're young and I'm not experienced enough to serve the Lord? That's okay. Same spirit, poured out in the same way. Male, female, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And as we look through, what is the result of this? Your sons and daughters will prophesy, and... Your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. So we can divide these down ultimately into two categories of spirit-inspired communications. What is the Holy Spirit going to do for God's people, the church, which is us? We see spirit-inspired communication with God. That's the dreams and the visions. Does God still give dreams and visions today? The Bible says, yes, he, yes, he does. Does that mean every dream we have is a dream from God? No. Does that mean no dreams that we have are dreams from God? No. And so God does speak to his people through dreams. He even says he's going to do that throughout the church age. So this idea of communicating with God, that God communicates with his people in a special and unique and personal way, that was not possible in the Old Covenant. And then secondly, we see spirit-inspired communication from God, and that's prophesy, prophecy. So basically the point is this. By God putting his Holy Spirit in us, his sanctifying present, he also now empowers us, his empowering present, in order for him to communicate with us more personally and more profoundly, and in order to communicate through us to those around us. And so the beginning of the fulfillment, and I'm just going to read it, not going to comment on it, but the beginning of the fulfillment of this is Acts chapter 2. So remember, when the day of Pentecost had come, so we're heading towards Christmas, then it'll be Easter, then it'll be Pentecost again. Time goes by fast, it seems. And when the day of Pentecost had come, the disciples were all in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves as they rested on each one. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. We ought to note there that the tongues they're speaking with is not the gift of tongues that Paul speaks about in 1 Corinthians, but this is prophecy, because the word here just means language, not unlike we might refer to our mother tongue. The language we grew up speaking would be our mother tongue. It's even, a, it's even an English expression. So the Holy Spirit filled them, and they began to speak with other languages as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven, and when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were bewildered because they each one were hearing them speak in their own language. And so this is, by definition, prophecy, because what is prophecy? Prophecy is just bringing a message from God to the people. There are times in the Old Testament where that relates to or ties into a speaking of something that will happen in the future. But for the most part, it's a message of calling people into a faithful relationship with the Lord. And that's what came about from this, as we know from our time looking at Acts, that it was the presentation of the gospel for the first time to the world. And so with all this going on, people were confused. People wondered what's happening. Some suggested maybe they're drunk. And Peter's answer was that men of Judea, men of Judea, and all you live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you give heed to my words, this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel, and then Luke quotes exactly our first scripture reading this morning, Luke, Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32, where what did the Lord say? That he would pour out his spirit on all mankind and they would prophesy. And so what was happening here was prophecy. So 1 Corinthians 14, which was our second scripture reading this morning, picks up on the Holy Spirit communicating with us and also through us, like we saw promised in Joel. And so we're going, to, we're going to look at that briefly. The best we can do is scratch the surface of this, and so we're not going to get into anywhere near the details that are found in here. One thing we ought to remember is the church in Corinth was a very, very dysfunctional church, and there was a lot of spiritual elitism within it. And one of the errors they had fallen into was believing that the sure sign of a spiritual person, of a person of elite spirituality, was the speaking in tongues. And so they didn't care how they lived their lives. If somebody spoke in tongues, that was, that was it. They were a spiritual giant. So there's a lot of corrective in what Paul is saying. But what we want to do is just focus in on two things, the two aspects of spirit-inspired communication so that we can see how we all can have fuller communications both with God and for God. 
So notice how Paul begins that chapter. The first thing he says is pursue love. Yet, desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands. But in his spirit he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. So what we see are those two ideas coming up that came up in Joel. So in this case, tongues is a spirit-inspired communication with God, and Paul says explicitly that person is only speaking with God. No one else has a clue what they're saying. In fact, as we read through this, we find not even the person speaking sometimes knows what it is that they're saying. And then the other is spirit-inspired communication from God. That's prophecy. And that's what Paul is saying to, to pursue that. So we ought to notice his first two words, pursue love. The greatest spiritual gift of all is love. So regardless of whether a person thinks they have a gift of teaching or helps or mercy or giving or anything else from the list or anything not on the list, because there's more things out there, above all of that, what's important is love. And when Paul says pursue love, it's a command. Keep pursuing love. Makes sense because we know 1 Corinthians 13, when we looked at God's image, what, about a year or so ago, a year and a half ago, we looked at this very passage. And Paul says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. That's the message of the church in Corinth. You guys think you're special because you're speaking in tongues? You don't have love, so you're, you're nothing. He says, if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, they will be done away. So seek the spiritual gifts, but if there's not love present, then it really doesn't matter. Not surprising, love is the greatest of the spiritual gifts. Remember, the fruit of the Spirit begins with, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And then the rest comes out of that. Think about Romans chapter 5, where Paul talks about how God commends his love for us in that at the right time, well, we were still his enemies. Think about that when we're in conflict with someone else. And we can look at them and, and even rightly say, that person has wronged me in such and such a way. And then we need to ask ourselves, okay, well, how did we wrong Christ? We wronged him a lot more than that person has wronged us. And Christ gave himself for us at that particular time. And then the same passage talks about how the Holy Spirit poured out the love of Christ into our hearts. And so that's key, and we know that's key. We don't need to get sidetracked with talking about how key the love of God is. But it's interesting that what Paul says here is that all the spiritual gifts, if exercised to an exceptional level, is done not in love, it's meaningless. There's some interesting implications. All the things that we do, all the good deeds we do, if they're not done in love, are completely, completely pointless. But on the other hand, when they are done in love, they're powerful means of grace both for us and for others. And so Paul tells us to be zealous for spiritual gifts. 14 verse 1, pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Now I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. And in a total 1 Corinthians 14 focuses on gifts related to communication, communications between us and God, communications on God's behalf with others. And so we're encouraged to seek these gifts in faith, pursue them. Notice how he's throwing it out to the whole, to the whole church. Every single one of us should seek spiritual gifts, but especially that we might prophesy. When's the last time that you prayed to God to help you to be a prophet? Probably been a while. Yet, that's what exactly Paul is telling us to do, that we ought to do that. And as far as the speaking in tongues, he says that, I wish you all would. But the prophecy is more important. So he's focusing in on this communication, and he's saying, seek these gifts in faith. So remember Luke chapter 11, one of my favorite passages in the Bible. It's so very, very meaningful to me anyway, where you've got a, a person has a visitor, comes from a long way, he's got nothing to offer before him, so he goes to his neighbor, knocks on the door at midnight, and says, could you give me some loaves of bread? I've had a visitor come and I have nothing to offer them. And that's where Jesus gets into talking about how when we ask for an egg, our father is not going to give us a scorpion and so on. And then ultimately he comes to this conclusion. So if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So when the Bible is commanding us to seek the Holy Spirit for various purposes and applications, 
Jesus is assuring us God will do that. God will answer the prayer. That's a prayer we can count on if we pray it in faith. But we need to keep in mind that one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he will, so it may not be his will that we ever function as a prophet or that we ever speak in tongues. And remember, these don't have to be continuous things. It could be once in your lifetime you do the one. It could be once in your lifetime that you do the other. But we ought to desire them. So looking, looking at the... Looking at the prophecy one, just very, very quickly, what does prophecy look like in the New Testament? It looks different than the Old Testament because we're called to examine everything that's said. It's not generally going to be like we read in Acts with Agabus where he wrapped himself up in a belt and said to Paul, that's what's going to happen to you if you go to Jerusalem. And Paul said, I don't care, I'm going anyway, I'm ready to die for Christ. Some churches that does, does happen, but it's kind of just a bit of you know, nonsense sometimes. But that stuff can happen, but it's more a matter of you're talking to someone, a fellow Christian, and you just say something to them that encourages them, that challenges them, that convicts them, that comforts them, and you're not quite sure where it came from. You just, you, you say it, and that person says to you, that's exactly what I needed to hear. That woke me up, or that comforted me, or that, or that gave me peace. That's what New Testament prophecy looks like. Most of the time, we don't know we're doing it. It's interesting that Charles Spurgeon gave some examples, and he didn't call it prophecy, but where he was in the middle of a sermon, he would stop and he would just say something. He would say, there's someone here in the congregation today, and he would say something. And after the service, the person would come up to him and say, you were talking to me. So really, that's what New Testament prophecy looks like. We don't know we're doing it. The other person doesn't know what's being done, but somehow we manage to give a special message of comfort or encouragement or challenging to one another. And that's, that's what the Bible talks about us, about us praying for with prophecy. But what about the communication with God? So this idea of speaking in tongues, and again, we're just going to scratch the surface of this and, get, and, and look at what's the main underlying point. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, verse 2, but to God, for no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, therefore let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? And here's the, here's the key, here's where we understand the meaning that Paul is talking about. I shall pray with the Spirit, and I shall pray with the mind. Also, I shall sing with the Spirit, and I shall sing with the mind. And then he goes on, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. point is, I thank God I speak in tongues is what he's saying. So ultimately what he's talking about is Spirit-empowered prayer and praise. So do you want a more powerful prayer life? Ask for the Holy Spirit, because that's how we pray with power. You want a more powerful life of praise and worship? Ask for the Holy Spirit, because that's who empowers us to, to give praise. Whether it is or is not in an unknown language is kind of irrelevant to the underlying point. So think about Spirit-empowered prayer. prayer. Romans 8.26, and in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Some people suggest that that is praying in tongues. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. And he who searches the hearts know what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And have you ever had the experience where you're praying in bed at night, and you fall asleep, and you wake up sometime later, and you're still praying, but you're not picked up where you left off? Somehow a whole bunch of prayer has gone on in between? There's, there's something that some of you may have experienced. The Spirit helps us in our prayer. Ephesians 6.18, and pray in the Spirit and on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Jude says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. So how do we pray effectively? In the Holy Spirit. How do we do that? Ask for help. We can't do that on our own. The Spirit will empower us. And then Spirit-empowered praise. Remember our, our look at John's Gospel, John 4. An hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And we talked about how real worship comes from the heart as inspired by the Holy Spirit who empowers us. And so when writing to the church in Galatia, Paul says in Galatians 4, 6, because you are sons, remember we're all sons of God in Christ, male and female, we have, we're joined heirs and have full status, fully equal in the kingdom of God. And so because of this, God has sent forth the spirit of his son. God has sent his Holy Spirit into our hearts, new covenant language, crying, Abba, Father. We're able to cry out to God our Father in praise and worship because of the Holy Spirit empowering us to do that. Philippians 3.3, 3, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus. Again, it's the Holy Spirit who empowers us to proper worship. 1 Corinthians 12.3, therefore I make known to you that no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So our prayer and our praise and our worship is all empowered by the Holy Spirit.
So to bring, to bring this to a close, and again, we've only scratched on the surface of so many interesting things in that passage, 1 Corinthians 14, we could look at, but the big picture idea is what's important for us, and that is God's empowering presence. God made this promise hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, that after Christ ascended into heaven, he would pour out his spirit on all mankind, sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions, and even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And we fall under all of those demographics, and we're in the church, and so we even have the confirmation of Acts chapter 2, that that began with the day of Pentecost. So what do we take away from this? We take away from this that we're all empowered to participate in the church. We're all empowered to participate in communications with God. Maybe we don't all speak in tongues. Maybe we don't all prophesy. But notice what Paul does say in verse 26. So what is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble each one. So basically he's saying here, every one of us has a contribution to make to the worship of God. Every one of us has a contribution to make to the building up of each other. And so it says each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. In other words, let's build each other up, however God empowers us to do that. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or three at most, and each in turn, let one interpret. And if there's no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church. Let him speak to himself and to God. So what would we do as a congregation if God poured his spirit on us and people started speaking in tongues? I think once the initial discomfort passed, we would turn to this and say, okay, well, let's follow the instructions and do it and do it that way. But remember, ultimately what that's talking about is whether it happens in another language or not, it's talking about God's empowering us to pray and he's empowering us to worship him. And then talking about the prophecy, let two or three prophets speak and let others pass judgment. So just because someone tells you a prophet and they have a word for the Lord, doesn't mean you have to believe them, test it, pray about it. Check with the scripture to see if it makes sense. But if a revelation is made to another who is seated, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one. There again is the idea we can all do it. We just have to seek it. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. In other words, it doesn't happen willy-nilly. You don't stand up in the middle of a church service and start yelling out, thus saith the Lord. That's not what Paul is saying. He's saying, do these things in an orderly way, because God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. And so we're going to close with this idea. Ultimately, what are we called to in 1 Corinthians 14? Regardless of all the complications and, and so on, we're called to pursue love and to pursue spiritual empowerment. Pursue love yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Now, I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. And when we're doing that, we're going to be living out what Paul calls us to do through Ephesians 5, where he says, and be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, speaking with the Lord, speaking to one another, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. So ultimately, God's empowering presence through the Holy Spirit enables us to communicate profoundly and deeply and personally with the Lord and with one another in a way that we can build one another up and encourage one another and challenge one another. And so our song of response this morning is a song that shows when we're living this out, the world will know we're Christians, and that song is, they'll know we're Christians by our love. So let's stand and join together in singing that.